you hear me now? Away? Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay.
Sternberger Foundation Colloquium at Greensboro College. Our speaker series provides opportunities for Greensboro College and the greater Greensboro community to learn about the complex issues facing our world. And we offer this because we have the faith and hope in our students and you, our community, that we may all leave here having learned, as our mission states, to think critically, act justly, and live faithfully and that you will be inspired to go out and address the issues that we present to you. So today we're going to hear from two, prom two important women in our community who are united in a bold movement to end local poverty. And they are wonderful role models, so when they speak in a moment, I hope you will listen and hear them well. Um, and very briefly, before I turn it over to the speakers, I would like to recognize the special guest that we have today, Bob Klepfer. Hey, Bob. He's the executive director of the Tannenbaum Sternberger Foundation, and he's a regular attendee to our colloquium series. And Bob, we can't thank you and, and the Tannenbaum Sternberger Foundation enough for underwriting. Their underwriting uh, um, pays for a lot of the cost of our speakers, publicity and printed materials, and refreshments in the back, which we hope you will all enjoy after, after the colloquium is over. So thank you again. And it's my pleasure to introduce our two special speakers today. Um, Michelle Gethers Clark is the President and Chief Executive Officer, United Way of Greater Greensboro, and Nadine Malbeth is United Way's Senior Vice President of Resource Development. And um, they work together to develop the resources needed to fund their agency's efforts. So together, they will share their stories of overcoming barriers and creating a bold movement to end local poverty. So please welcome Michelle Gethers Clark and Nadine Malbeth. <laughs> When you get to the site, if you would just type in that number, and it will get you started. And what this is going to do, it's going to ask you some questions, one at a time. It will give you an answer, a place, a way, a way for you to, to give your answer, and then it will tell you if you're right or wrong. And I think it might even ask for a screen name. Is that right, Bailey? Did we do that? I think it's going to oh, yes. uh -huh. give you one. Oh, here we go. You have to install it, right? No. You can just access it through your web browser. But when it says spin, we don't really spin. Yeah, you can just click it. Yeah, just click mm -hmm. spin. Okay. Oh, that's going to tell me what my nickname is. Okay. There will be a time limit on the questions, so don't think too hard. Always go with your best guess. When in doubt, go with C. Is that what they say in college? Probably not. Okay. 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 
Okay, so here we go. It's all been waiting for. Only eight questions. Oh. <laughs> and the question is, is Michelle or Nadine? Oh. Who is more likely to come from a wealthy family? <laughs> They're all anonymous. More likely? Not <laughs> Just Nadine. Don't. Read in, don't read into the question. I'm going to have to shout out the answers. <laughs> okay. Here we go. What's our next question? Based on probability, Nadine. <laughs> no, oh. As a spirit news. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Let's go to the next question. In the United States, Nadine. You want us to wear our prejudicial now? Answer with your heart. Answer with your heart. Michelle or Nadine? Okay. Who 
qualify for food stamps as an adult? Last one. Michelle has leathers on and Nadine doesn't. So that's Nadine. Nadine. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, I'm the woman who carries a purse at a meeting. <laughs> and I'm the Senior Vice President of Resource Development for the United Way. It is so exciting to stand here in front of you guys. I was here at the last um, talk and thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. And when talking with Dr. Leslie, we kind of came up with this idea because I think it's a great way to show what people really don't understand or pretend like they don't understand. And maybe down, maybe down deep inside in their core, they know that we do not view everyone the same, and that we discount people for many different ways, both, po both positively and negatively. I grew up in a military family. I've been a, a Navy dependent my whole entire life. I was married for three years before I did not live in Navy housing. I didn't know you were supposed to turn the lights out. I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know anything like that, because you always lived in Navy housing. My parents, my father was a, retired as a Navy captain. My mother was a homemaker. And I like to say that in the 70s, in the late 70s and early 80s, I missed it somehow because I always lived behind the fence. And it was probably the most diverse group of people because we were all in the military. The only thing everyone had was short hair. Never saw anybody with long hair until I went to college because that was the military way. So in a lot of ways, I was very protective, but also I believe I really understood diversity because back then, and some of you might not remember, but if, if your father was in the military, deployments and wars and all that, they could be gone for a year at a time. And military families come together and if, you know, what was happening at your house, if you didn't like for dinner, maybe you walked outside and maybe somebody else was having something better. And you just did that and everyone looked out for each other. So everyone told on each other that you had lots of moms and it really was a great environment. So typical military life, I went through high school in one place and then had to go to college. Um, I was a okay student. I, I, was, I played a lot of sports. So I was okay in academics. I got to college and I moved to a college that was from a state where I was not from. My parents moved directly after that and moved to Philadelphia. So I really didn't know anybody at school and I didn't know anyone at home. I did fall in love though. And I did fall in love with a military man. And if you know anything about the military, my husband was a Navy captain and I fell in love with an E-5. No, your father was a Navy captain. Yeah, my father was a Navy captain, oh. sorry. My father was a Navy captain, and Stu was E5. And that's a very big, broad span. In fact, I was telling Michelle that after our first date, my father called Stuart's um, supply captain and suggested that maybe Stuart not date me anymore. <laughs> and so then Captain Fisher called down to the lieutenant, who called down to his master chief, that called down to his chief, and they had a little talk about this, this relationship was supposed to end. I went to college for a year and a half and left. Because I was in love. I was so in love. And I was so stupid. Looking back then, <laughs> if my daughter would have done that to me, I would have killed her. <laughs> I left college to get married to go to Key West, Florida. That's where we were going to live. Now my mom, great woman, was a housewife. She never had a job. She always stayed home. So she was all for this. 
no problem. I think my dad, just being the dad that he was, and you know, sometimes in that capacity, I think he was a little sexist. So it wasn't any big deal that I didn't go to college. I was getting married, and I was I was getting the mommy degree, and so off I went to Key West, Florida. And um, if you haven't ever been to Key West, Florida, well, if you've been 32 years ago, it's not like it is today. It was a great place. I think we had like an equivalent to a Target called J. Byron's, um, all local. And you could be a bartender or work in a shop or you could work for the government. I was a GS1. That's an exciting thing. My first job was the assistant to the assistant's CO secretary. When everyone went to lunch, I got to answer the phone. I kept the coffee filled, and I sharpened pencils. There were my big responsibilities. So um, when I got married, my father's master chief's wife pulled me aside and said, Nadine, you always should be able to, regardless of what's happening in your life, to take care of yourself and take care of your children. You never know when something could happen to your husband, and he might not be there, or you might have to leave a situation. And you want to be able to leave when you want to leave on your terms. And that probably was the best advice I ever got, because I really listened to that. Military families move all the time. And I was very lucky to get into a program that was a stepping stone program. And I met my first mentor. <coughs> and she basically sat me down and said, if you're going anywhere, you need a college degree. And I will, I will get you the money to do that. So the government paid for not only my degree, but also my master's degree. And that set me on my track. When Sarah and I first got married, we qualified for food stamps. We were the ones, because we made so little money. So we wanted to talk about this because of the many barriers in place. So it was great that the government was paying for my college, but I was still working. Stuart was deployed. I've been married for 36 years, and I think we figured out that he was gone for probably 18 years, if you put all the deployments and stuff together. Mm -hmm. I had no one to take care of my daughter, who was now three. So lo and behold, my mother, moved from Savannah so she could be with us. She said to be with me, but I think she was really to be with my daughter. And took care of her while I went to school, both college and, and my um, master's. So looking back on it now, my sister and I had a discussion about this. And I said, you know, I never thought of it this way, because my sister didn't call it, finish college either. It wasn't a priority for my mother. Now, she always supported us. But education was not a priority. And since coming to United Way and learning what I have, I spent 19 years in nonprofit. And I know in nonprofit, the people that work in nonprofit and volunteer for nonprofits have a passion. It's something that's drawing them into this career and keeping them there. And that's what I fell in love with. So it's been very ex exciting. Um, when I worked for the American Cancer Society for 19 years. And then I heard about what this United Way was doing, and I heard about the CEO, which you're going to hear next, because she's remarkable. But when we started talking about everything that we overcome, and when we talk a little bit more about poverty, everybody has barriers. The question is, do you have help getting over these barriers? I am very lucky because I had a lot of help. Because if you looked at me, you probably not thought that I had more barriers than you should. So it, it doesn't matter how many you have, it's do you have someone to help you get over them? Yep. And that's what we're doing here at the United Way. So now I'm going to turn it over to Michelle and we're talk her story. So I am the product of two parents from the segregated South, a town called Rita, South Carolina, where their school was closed because they were black. They said, we will not pick cotton and cucumber our whole lives. We will not live on a dirt road. We will not go to the bathroom in an outhouse. And they boarded a bus at 17 years old and headed to New York City, uneducated and black. They moved into the tenements in Bronx, New York. They gave birth to my sister, who was born deaf. They got the lucky coin and moved into public housing on the Lower East Side of Manhattan 
Alfred E. Smith Projects. I was born. My brother was born. With three priorities in our house. Family first. Faith and education. My mother often told us, I don't know what this place called college is, but I do know that the people at the post office who went to college are doing well. And I want my three children to do well. And so I grew up with this aspiration that I did not understand and could not effectively be articulated to me that I needed to go to college. So I went to public school number one, and I must say that I was a fairly bright kid. And it is because people poured into me. People helped me. By the time I was in fourth grade, my parents could no longer help me with my homework. But teachers jumped in because they understood the situation. They tore down the barrier that separated me from many, which was I had parents who didn't immigrate like many people had in the Lower East Side of Manhattan back then, but they migrated from the segregated South. And we were a melting pot. Lower East Side of Manhattan is, was filled with first generation everything. And it was a great place to grow up. Unfortunately, in my life, my mother died when I was 14. And I thought that my dream of going to college would have to die too. But her sister adopted the three of us. My 29-year-old aunt woke up one day. She was the mother of two. She went to sleep, woke up the next day. She decided to be the mother of five. And she was only 17 years older than I was. And she took us in. And she told me, that dream of going to college, I too, she did not get to finish school either. And she refused to pick that cotton and cucumber. And she got on a bus some years later. And my mother took care of her. And so she just felt the least she could do was take care of her three kids. And I don't want your pity. I just want you to understand. It doesn't matter where you begin. It's how you end this game called life. And you see, all of us will be reduced to a dash on our tombstone. The day we were born and the day we die. And there is only a dash in between. And so my dash is about what can I do for my fellow man. So I got the opportunity to go to college because I was viewed as high risk in New York City. Statistics say that a girl like me is gonna drop out of high school and is gonna be pregnant. Ha ha, statistics. <laughs> I got the opportunity to work for an administrative court judge in Social Security Administration in New York City because I was so high risk. One day I was sitting in a class, I was called to the counselor's office and she said, we have a slip and I still have the slip and I should have bought it today. And it was called the Stay in School Federally Funded Program. And they said, go down to the Social Security Administration because they're gonna give you a job. And the only requirement is you have to stay School. I was like, oh yeah, I knew I was staying in school. I thought this is the ticket to win. <laughs> and I went on down to the Social Security Administration. I could type. The other thing my aunt told me, do not leave school not knowing how to type because the ladies in the office do much better than I do as a mail handler because that's all that she could do given her skill set and that's what my mom also did. Box and mail. We don't box mail anymore, it's automated. <laughs> so um, I uh, went down there, got that job. When it was time for me to go to college, no one in my family had filled out an application before. So the administrative court judge said, you're going to college. So Judge Shapiro stayed after work and he would fill out applications. 
And not only that, he would write the checks and give them to me. <laughs> and when I got in, I actually didn't tell anybody. I told him first. He opened his desk drawer and he pulled out the canceled check. And he said, I want you to have this because I want you to remember anything is possible. <laughs> and I just recall that, you know, it's, we live in such a divisive world. Judge Shapira and I, we had nothing in common except that I walked in there one day as a 10th grader, 15 years old, and he saw something in me that I did not see in myself. And, you know, he was like, you're going. You're going, you're going, you're going. And so that cancel check and that slip really, really, really set me on a trajectory to be successful. And I don't look back. And I do not have pity parties. And I do not think that I was dealt the wrong hand. I was dealt the hand of adversity because it makes me stronger. And it allows me to stand here in front of you. It allows me to really fight this battle called ending generational poverty. And so Nadine and I are actually unlikely to be together in the journey called life. There are many people who are unlikely to be together, but that's why we've got to know that we've got common hope. And that's what really brought us together, this idea called common hope. That, and hope is just about everybody can reach their full potential. Everybody can dream. Everybody can be something bigger. And so I got the opportunity to go to school. I finished straight through in my four years because I had to, because we had no money. So it was four and done. And I tell my son that too. Four and done. <laughs> so he's in college now. I'm like, you've got to get out of there in 2020. I'm booking my hotel reservations at the beginning of t January 2019. And you better be graduating, because if you're not, I am. <laughs> I'm walking across that stage. And so uh, I finished in four years. I wanted to be a CPA. I took the CPA exam. I passed. I worked in public accounting. I went on to work at American Express for 21 years, uh, ascended to the level of senior vice president. I hung up my heels in 2019, excuse me, in 20, uh, 2009, because my daughter was diagnosed with epilepsy and a learning disability. So I said, you know what, God, haven't I had enough? Can't somebody else kind of get one of these cards? But you know, I've never looked back and I decided to quit my job because I was on the road a lot. I was in India, Philippines, Canada, Phoenix, South Florida, New York. I was gone all the time. I actually just lived here. This was really just the bedroom community because I was really on a plane most of the time in the building working. Uh, so in 09, when I quit, I went on this discovery. I said, so let me explore this place that we moved to in 2000, been here nine years. And I didn't know what was going on in Greensboro. I lived in a cocoon. I did not realize the adversity that was facing people in my own community. And when I went, and, and so when I discovered this, um, I was on the board of the hospital, I was on the board of Bennett College, I was on the board of United Way. And I just started asking some questions about some of the statistics that were being shared with us and then I was lost all the time because I didn't know my community. And so I started to see the different alcoves of our community. And I saw the tale of two cities. And I said, hmm, what should we be doing about this? And so as I sat on the board um, at United Way, they were having some operational challenges. And the board chair said, would you please resign from the board? and help us with some of our operations, given your background. And I said, you know what, sure. I had just opened my own consulting business after I had written a book. And I uh, became a consultant. Uh, a few months later, the CEO decided that he was going to move to Atlanta. And they asked me to take the role of CEO and president. And I actually said no. Because I did not view myself as a social impact person. I viewed myself as a pure capitalist who only knew financial services. And I didn't think that I could do 
a good job for them. But I decided to uh, take the position some months later because I really realized that we could turn this ship around called generational poverty. We could really do something. And I'm a product of that topic. And I know that it is not the same era or the same community, but I know the tenacity that lives within people to do well. And no matter what your social economic status, everybody wants to do well. No one aspires to be poor. No one aspires not to feed their children. And so I took on that task five years ago, and here I am. And we have made tremendous progress since then. So, this is something that I hear all the time. And it's personal. So, we wanted to get here today. And many people want to get somewhere. So Nadine, how long does it take to get here? We drove here, it took what? Seven minutes maybe at the most? Well, Bailey started crazy. I'm not trying to follow her. Parking took a half hour. Yeah. 2.4 <laughs> miles. That's where our United Way is, on the NC boat. If you had to take the bus, <laughs> now, we do have a bus line in our great city. Have you ever ridden the bus? Raise your hand if you've ridden the bus. Good. Okay, if you have it, check it out. But if we did the bus route, it would have taken us an hour and 31 minutes. And we would have had to walk a little. Hopefully, it wouldn't have started raining. Couldn't do yeah, because I don't do rain. And we couldn't carry the line. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how we would have had to, that's the bus that would have done. So, we could have walked here faster. Then taken the bus. And so when we decide that people are lazy, who don't have money, there are many people who will walk because they have a spot, a gumption, a tenacity to do so. I think what, what I'm so excited about my job here at the United Way is, is one, the people, but the ability to watch in less than a year a person go from here to there just like that when we help bring those barriers down. And that, for someone who's worked in a nonprofit to actually see something that you could say, wow, I was a part of, is very special. And you know, if we are going to change this and change poverty in this city, we've got to start looking at those barriers and we've got to realize that for some people it might just be one or two barriers. And then for some people, they'll might, there might be seven or eight or nine or ten barriers. And how are we going to do that as a, as a city, as people that live here, as people who work here? Now, I'm just going to share something about Michelle. We I mean, have family here today, so I think uh -oh. I can be very I don't know what she's going to say. say. <laughs> but Michelle Clark, executive, came from not, she wasn't a nonprofit person. She was a for-profit person. She came into a southern city, we're in Greensboro, and Dr. Leslie, you were on the board when she came, right? Just after. Mm -hmm. Just after? So if you had to say, how would you describe the board? Not, not good guys, bad guys, but what were, like how many men, how many women, My and what was their... My first impression was very white. Mm -hmm. What was your age, would you say? Um, 50s or, or so. What really shocked me was the first time I was in United Way and I walked down and looked at all the pictures of the United Way executives. Exactly. So here was a woman, not from the nonprofit background, that came into a room and convinced a lot of very nice white men to invest and change their whole focus of the United Way model to concentrate on poverty in the city. There were a few who seemed like they, they blew some ivories at first. <laughs> but just the ability to get someone to understand that 
this city has poverty. Because there's a lot of people that we talk to that have no idea that our city is 31% higher than the national average. And being higher is not a good thing. So that means, oh my gosh, there's a whole lot of people that don't look like me. Everyone here may not know what the poverty rate is. Yeah. So the poverty rate in our city for adults is 20% and for children is 25%. Hmm? It's increase. Huh? It's in the quiz. Oh, it's in the quiz. Oops. We'll give you that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, but I mean, how many, um, what it, it means to be poor. Yeah. Your income level. So your income level for a family of four is $24,300. If you make less than that, and you are a family of four, you cannot eat, pay your rent, pay your utilities, and provide your family with transportation or clothing. You can't do all of them, so you have to choose. Which and if you worked a minimum wage job, <coughs> how many hours do you think it would take for you to bring enough money home to take care of you and a child? In a week. In a week. Just say yes. 63. Keep guessing. Eight, 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 eight. Eight. Oh. I'm sorry, what did you say? Eight, 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 eight. Keep going. More. <clears throat> a little higher. A little higher. It's around 140. I work hard. You know, seven but and a quarter. I, I don't work that hard. You know, at minimum wage, seven and a quarter. Seven and a quarter, 135 hours a week in order to afford your own basic needs. Mm -hmm. No vacation, no eating out. Basic needs, and the and, and we assume a two bedroom because it's kids mm -hmm. involved also. So, when you when you think about that, that's amazing. That in this great city we have this problem, and that that's not acceptable for me. Right. And it's not acceptable for Michelle. Right. And that's really why we're here. We're here not to tell our stories, but to unite us because of our stories. And everybody in this room has a story. It's just that you're willing to tell it. I used to be ashamed of my story because I was trying to ascend the corporate ladder and most people did not have the same story I had. But the day that I became bold and started to understand that my history informs who I am, and my history makes me stronger. So the question is, what is your aspiration for Greensboro? So now this is the audience participation part. So everybody pull out your pen, and I want you to write in one word. One word? One word. Your first name in one word. What do you aspire for Greensboro? So I know students, you may not live here permanently, but while you're here, what is your so aspiration? To marry any military people before you graduate. Okay. One word. I, and that's probably hard to do on a college campus. Because y'all do word counts for everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you do not have all afternoon. I'm tiny. Does everybody have something to write with? Yes. Okay, one word. Put your first name and write big so we can read it. I'm over 12, so I need large letters. When you are finished, I want, uh, oh, well, who's finished? Raise your hand. Okay, now, come on. Come on. Students, one word. What do you aspire? If you had to dream a dream for Greensboro, what would it be? There's no 
wrong answer, by the way. Okay, I want you to take your piece of paper and I want you to ball it up into the best ball that you can get. Back row, stand up, please. Everybody in the back row, come on now. It's like church. Oh, excuse me, it's like the Baptist church. <laughs> You have to take your aspiration, and I would like for you to throw it through the top rung of this ladder. So I'm here? Yes, darling. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot change your position in the room. reminder that we don't all get to choose 
where we are in society, and especially where we start. But if we share the rules of the game, you will position yourself to a success. Our great students are here because they know they have to position themselves for success. That's what we do at United Way all day. We have to position people who are in generational poverty to reach their aspiration, to climb the ladder of success and get to the top rung. Not the rung we decide they should be for and get through, but the rung they decide. Because hope is about your aspirations, your dreams your thoughts, your goals. And so this ladder, I want you to think about ladders very differently. And I want you to think about your position in rooms very differently from this day forward. Because the reality is, not everybody gets to leave the ground room. And all of us in this room are blessed with an education. All of us are blessed with a roof that we will go home to. We are blessed with something to eat, etc. So we thank you for your aspirations. We're going to share them in a minute, and we're running out of time. Okay. So we can just do this very quickly, but just to show you a little bit about poverty. Re-log in, are they still good? Yeah, just reload the page you're on and it'll ask you for, or you can type in the kahoot.it again. It'll be a new pin. I love the question page. On my end. Wow. I was born into the millennial position. I know. <laughs> Bailey said she couldn't send me and Nadine over here by ourselves. <laughs> Good thing. Is there any more of these floating around the room? I think there may be a couple. Come on, y'all. And, and we're giving you the answers. You just have to pick one. <laughs> Much better. Yay. <laughs> Woohoo. Who's Snowy Bear? <laughs> <laughs> so we've been in business for how long? Trying to impact. 
39,277. That's how much you need to make. Look at Snowy Bear. <laughs> Are you surprised at that? Yeah. Now, that's a lot. Right. That, that's a whole lot. 39,000, unless jobs are 22 or 23. That's right. That's what, what, what did we say? Minimum wages? Yes. 70, 80, 175. Right. 135. So can you kind of see where it becomes harder and harder? And when we go back to the question that people are lazy, there's a lot of people that just want to be able to take care of their families. They want to be able to take care of themselves and have the dream that all Americans do. 70% of the people who receive food stamps work. People are not at home receiving food stamps. It's not 70, 70? 70. And nobody knows that. They all think they get it. Of course they do. But there are people who actually know that. We just don't share that because it is so much easier to call people lazy. Mm -hmm. And if you live in public housing, <laughs> public housing, they take half of your income, regardless of how much you make. It's very hard to get out of public housing unless you have a cheerleader behind you that is helping you and guiding you. So the reality is there's some heavy lifting to do. We all got to get in this game with this little child. Yes. Why are most of your slides not diverse? There's no reason. I think Maybe they'll become diverse. I'd like to see give, me <laughs> <laughs> give me a chance. Give me a chance. I know so, when I worked in marketing at UNCG, a lot of times it wasn't diverse enough. It needs to be diverse. Okay, done. I mean, that's my suggestion. Thank you. For what it's worth. Thank you. So our reality is, is there's some heavy lifting that we all have to do. And heavy lifting does not always mean money. Heavy lifting means voice. There are a lot of people who are voiceless. In our community, 57,000 people live in generational poverty. 16,000 of those 57,000 are children. And they need help. And if their parents are structurally left out, it's hard for them to advocate for their own kids. They are not lazy. They are not at home smoking drugs and not caring about their kids. Can you imagine that the only time a, a child, that we have children right here in the city that rely on school to be fed, mm -hmm. and what happens when school is canceled mm -hmm. and bad weather, mm -hmm. and what makes the difference of, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to eat for the next couple days. That really happens here in Greensboro. So we're going to talk a little bit about solutions. Some of the things we've got to do is we've got to honor citizens no matter where they are, young and more seasoned. And right now, we are trying to build systems that honor people rather than in a crib, excuse me, actually before they're born, all the way to senior citizens. Whether it's providing a warm meal for a senior citizen or helping them to raise their grandchildren or making sure that a young mother is pre prenatally ready to give birth and everything in between. And we fundamentally work with things like making sure people have their basic needs met because when your basic needs are not met, it's hard to learn in school. And it's hard to go to work when you're sick. And it's hard to take care of your family when you're not working. So you see how all of this kind of fits together? So there is no one thing that your United Way is doing. We are looking at a portfolio of services to look at the whole family. You see, we've got to be more holistic as we think about solutions. 
it's not that giving someone food is not good. It is good because it meets their fundamental need. It's not enough. People need more than food who are living in poverty. They need a job that pays a wage that will grow over time. They need skills so they can get a job that pays more over time. And they need to save money because emergencies happen to everyone. Has anybody ever had a flat tire in here who owns a car? <laughs> Was it convenient? <laughs> <laughs> but you had the resources to do something about it. Or you call home to mama and daddy or something, right? People like us can't call home. We just have to get it done. We know that we have vulnerable populations in our community. And sometimes when you are statistically excluded and your housing is vulnerable, when the tornado touched down in Greensboro on April 15th, it hit a very vulnerable community. So what happens is people already had, in some cases, substandard housing, and that tornado hit, it really just And I believe that the glass is always half full, and I'm hoping that there are families and people who will wind up being better off than they were before, but they have to go through a struggle in this mm -hmm. interim period. And this is absolutely happening. So we've got to think about solutions, not for people who are going to make it anyway. We've really got to create solutions for people who wind up in the back of the room all the time. And we've got to evolve our solutions. So there has to be an evolution. We've been in this market. We will celebrate one century in 2022. We can't do what we did in 1922. We can't do what we did in 1950. We can't even do, keep, continue to do what we did in 2000. We've got to evolve with the community, with technology, and with the needs of the people. And that's what United Way is doing. It's saying, what do we do to put this generation of people to work? There is only one solution to poverty. What is it? Income. <laughs> We've made poverty a moral issue. It is not a moral issue. It, is a economic issue. It will always be an economic issue. The only way that you can be defined that you are in poverty is, is that I count your money or lack thereof. People who hurt other people are not in poverty. They just hurt other people. People who don't have any money are in poverty. And so we get the statistic confused in our judgment starts to play in, and our bias, and the fact that it is not an equal playing field. It is not. And so it's really important for us to recognize that. And what's different about this United Way is because we had a very courageous board of directors and a CEO that said, we are not going to do business like we've been doing it. We are not going to just give money away for anything. We are going to look at the issues and we're going to look at return on investment, and we're going to look to see how we can cha make change happen. And that's what's different about this United Way. Because all United Ways are different. So this is not your mother's and father's United Way. This is the new United Way. And solutions have got to be scalable and sustainable. So it can't be what's the flavor of the week. <laughs> Nor can we boil the ocean. So we've got to be really careful not to try to do everything and be all things to all people. We can't do that. So we've got to be smart. We've got to make investments. We don't spend money, we invest money. And investment means return. So for those of you who are making investments, just like our students are making investments in their education, they expect a return. And most of all, their mothers and fathers expect a return. Call, get out of my house and get your own place and get a job, right? <laughs> so we really got to make sure that we think about how do we scale up solutions and how do we sustain them. And here's where you come in again. We need you. We need you 
to be as knowledgeable as you can about what poverty means and its impact on your community. Poverty is a global issue. 44 million people in the United States live in poverty. 44 million. What we do in Greensboro could be a model for the nation. And not that we are looking to be a model for the nation, but what we are looking to do is one family at a time, put them on a pathway out of poverty. And it doesn't matter to me whether you are born in South Carolina, New York City, or Greensboro, North Carolina. So here's some headlines. I really want to read you back your headlines. So Nadine, you got the papers. Imagine that next March 2nd, or Saturday morning, you woke up and you saw the headlines that 1,000 jobs are created for youth and it re represents the community's investment in the future. When young people do not work, we love to call them thugs and we like to say what they're not doing. We have to give them jobs. No, they don't know anything, but they can learn the culture of work. So for those of you who are hiring leaders, it won't hurt your budget to hire a young person for the summer. Imagine the headline on Saturday morning, September 5th, 2020, Greensboro becomes a <coughs> model for public, private, and nonprofit collaboration to improve social and economic mobility for children and families. Imagine the headline on Saturday morning, February 19th, 2022, the regional poverty rate declines, and it is linked to the decrease in food insecurity. On these days, in those years, it's possible for this to be the headline, but only if we work together, only if we join the movement. And here's what you said your headlines are. Understanding. Change commu community. <laughs> Generosity. Secure happiness. Fed. Progressive. Non racism. Thriving. What's the last one? I'm sorry. Thriving. Thriving. Okay. Wonderful. Understanding. Those are the words that you use. Yes. In 2040, I will be on a rocking chair, God willing. <laughs> Greensboro becomes the first South Eastern city to have its poverty rate fall below the national average. It's possible. If we pay attention and if we decide it's possible, if we share the common hope that people are both. we are in the people business. What's the national average? 14%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? And we're at 31? No, we're at 20. We're 31% higher. And that's calculated based upon that artificially low poverty line. Yes, well. it is. You make $24,301. Let me tell you something. Class. If we talk about self sufficiency, that's another, that's another colloquial. Mm -hmm. So, we know your aspiration. We ask you to join the movement. We need your help. We cannot do this alone. The Stanford United Way is 27 people. 27 people who actually want to put the United Way out of business. And the only way for us to go out of business is to achieve the headline of no problem. And maybe not in our lifetime, but we've started. And we need you to join the movement. It is a movement. It's a movement that whether this place is called your home or not, it matters all over the world. That there are people who care that other people are living in poverty and deserve a chance. Why would we exclude everyone in the background fully participate in society. But that's what we do. Thank you for your time. So it is four o'clock. A little after four. So our time is up.
So if there are any burning questions. Yes, 30 minutes more. We do? Oh, good, okay. Well, good, because, let me just, Michelle oh. has coined a phrase, and I think it's very important. It's called get a job, a better job, and get a career. Maybe C's. Because, as we said, going back to that minimum wage, it's not enough to get someone a job at Home Depot because that is not going to have them take care of their family. They've got to get a better job where now they get benefits and they get raises. We have a young lady who started work last week and for the first time she had to look at a benefits package because she got a real job, as she said. And she's not willing to stay there. She's going to keep going to school and she's going to progress in that system so she can get a higher job and then have a career so she can take care of her son. But when we talk about this, this is really important because we, when Michelle said we need you, we need you in a lot of ways. Yep. Now, I am the money woman. So we were talking earlier, you know, our development people ask money, but that's not all that we need. We need people to understand our mission. We need people to be involved. We need people to advocate. We need a lot of people doing a lot of things. And there's something for everyone at the United Way. And Dr. Leslie is a great example because he, you know, helped decide what programs we were going to fund, how much money would be funded. Everything that United Way does is really driven by volunteers. I would love to say that Michelle and I make all the decisions and it's great, but that's not true. It's not. We really make very little decisions. We put everything on the table, and our volunteers make the decision of how are we fighting poverty, and whose programs are we going to fund, and how much money will be involved. Just last weekend, we had Trunk or Treat. We had a place, a safe place in the community where children could come with their parents, trick or treat around our parking lot. It was a fabulous day. And that's another way, and that whole day was was driven by our young professionals group because it was important to them to make sure that there was a place that in this city, in that neighborhood, that children could come to. We're doing amazing things, but it takes amazing people to do those things. And that's just another way that you can be part of your United Way by getting involved and volunteering. So it does an old man sociologist part. Uh, good to hear you talk about social structures that both provide opportunities for some people yeah. and prevent opportunities for some people yeah. as well. So my question is, um, what is the United Way doing right now in terms of um, trying to remedy those structures to open up opportunities? So often, you know, we when we talk about the pool. We'll inadvertently blame the poor. They don't have the education. They don't have, and we, we put the onus of getting out of poverty on the poor. Yeah, so I'm gonna tell you something. If you mistreat a child, you get a social worker who works with you to improve. If you come out of prison, you get a probation and a parole officer who help you to stay on track. If you are structurally poor, you have to figure it out on your own. So one of the so a couple of things that we believe we believe that a lot of people are without because they don't know any better. So we are actually looking to build systems that connect people, so that people we have a system called two one one. When you have an emergency, what number do you call? Nine one one. What's your expectation? Immediate? Then they'll show up. Response. Yeah. Response. A remedy. Help. Solution. Help. So we have a number called 211 that the United Way has in the entire state of North Carolina, all 100 counties. It is of critical importance that we get the word out in our community. Did we bring any 211 cards? No. Um, that everyone knows that when people are in need, you've got to refer them to 211 because a lot of times people spiral because they don't know where to go. And all they have to do is pick up the phone and say, I need, and, they, and give them a zip code and we will tell you where to go. So we've got to have those universal systems and solutions. 
And so that's one solution we have in the market. We'll look into take that to the next level by putting in automated referrals. So you go and you get your food stamps and they will ask you, do you have a primary care physician? Do you, are you connected with work supports? Are you housed? We have uh, just finished the design of a platform that is going to be able to help them to say, here is, I am referring you, what's your name? I'm referring you to Maya, and we're going to send Maya an automated referral to say, Maya, Michelle is coming, and here's what she needs, and we filled out the basic application already. Because the other thing people tell us in generational poverty, I've got to tell people something 20 times for them to tell me I'm not eligible. So we give people the runaround. So there are things that we are structurally trying to fix, not for United Way, but for the community. These solutions just make sense for everyone. But we especially want people who feel that they are not getting the benefit of the doubt to be able to use these systems. We also have something called the Family Success Center, which is a place-based strategy Statistics and research tell us that solutions that are proximate to where people live are better solutions. So, if this roof were leaking, where would we put the bucket? Well, guess where we put the solutions for people who are poor? We put them on the other side of campus. And then we say, why don't you have time? You can't get there. So we know this idea approximate. It's called put solutions closest to the problem. It's called Six Sigma. It's called Lean. It has a lot of technical names, but I think we all understand a leaky roof that deserves a bucket deserves the bucket under the leak. And so we are putting solutions in communities. If there's a need in a community, put the solution in the community and stop having them drive to North Elm right. Street. If we had a map of the city and we overlaid and put all the nonprofits on it, do you think they'd all be clumped together? No. They are spread all over this city, which is great unless you needed to go to three or four of them mm -hmm. and you had to ride an hour and 15 minutes on the bus. To get 2.4 miles. Mm -hmm. You know, carrying your children or, mm -hmm. or whatever else you're doing. And or you go to one spot and they say, you know, we, you were supposed to bring your social security card and proof of residency and blah, 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 blah. If you didn't know that, it's going to get very tough to get back on that bus, go all the way home, get all that stuff, get back on the bus, go there. We make it so very hard for a lot of people. So this concept of bringing everything under one roof and, and treating people with dignity and creating that family culture experience and making it kind of like a college campus is something new and exciting. Yeah. And the four things that we have to get done there is we've got to get people educated. Um, there in our beta test, 40% of the families didn't even have a GED. That is actually statistically impossible, except if you cluster people together and you profile people and put them in the same name. It's actually statistically impossible in America that 40% of the population that doesn't even, didn't even graduate from high school. That's design. You design that. So we've got to get people educated. When you get a mother and father educated, that mother and father think very differently about their children's education and they value it differently. So that's what we're trying to do in place space. We also know that there is a culture to work. Many of us who are a little bit more seasoned we will say that young people don't have soft skills or employees don't have soft skills. People come to work cussing, people come to work late. People don't understand what it means to show up and be present and be committed. So we're teaching people soft skills in the culture of work. The third thing that we're doing is sick people cannot work and sick people do not learn in school. So we've got to make sure people are well. So we've got to take care of health, be it physical or mental. And fourth, and certainly not least, is financial literacy. The challenge we have is people do not know the difference between net and gross pay. They do not understand the benefit of having benefits. And they do not always understand the value of saving something. 
So I am not judgmental. I, tell, I have told people my entire life, save something. It's not about the amount. So those are four things we're doing in place space. So it has to be strategic. It's to, not co-location. Because a lot of times people say, okay, gather all the buckets under the loop. Under the leaf. No, 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 no. Stack the buckets so that they talk to each other and they're solving for the same problem in different ways. And we are the only, we're one of the only, or maybe there's a couple been added since, but you can work on your GED and you get free childcare. Because if you go back and say, wow, if I don't have someone to take care of my child, how am I going to get my GED? And this was a very bold move, and that's why we partnered where we did on our first family success center with Guilford Child Development, because the child care was there. When you start taking some of those barriers away from people, then they have the opportunity to thrive. And then we also give them uh, vouchers to ride the bus. So now they have transportation, because you know, even in a community, and in one zip code, if you go to 27406, it's probably the largest zip code in our area. So you could be in very in one zip code and still need to take a bus. Yeah. So that's what we've done. And then we're feeding the child and the parent. So we're taking all those barriers so they can use the resources that Michelle just talked about. And I think the exciting thing about our strategy is we talked about the importance of sustaining and scaling up. We are opening the Second Family Success Center in December because it's an, when you have 57,000 people, you cannot serve them in one location. You can't even serve them in four locations at the same time. So we are opening our Second Family Success Center. The first one, as Nadine said, is at Gilbert Child Development. The second one will be Salvation Army, Center of Hope. A lot of the classes will be in the evening. Uh, there's a term that is often used in America. It's called the working poor. And there are people, like I said, 70% of the people getting food stamps work. So when they're at work, they can't go to a GED class during the day. So we need to make it convenient in their neighborhood, put the bucket under the leaf, catch the water, catch the solutions, catch the energy, make it easy. So we'll be doing classes until 7 p.m. So that's really exciting. So we, uh, as we build out these centers, they're not done for the people, they're done with the people. And so we're building solutions with people that we're serving and asking them what they need and asking subject matter experts what is needed in the community. So we're really excited about it. Our goal is to stand up four family success centers by 2022 when we celebrate our 100th year anniversary. It is also our goal to build a platform that I share with you with these automated referrals that I can go to Maya and Maya knows I'm coming as she provides me with services. So there are a number of things that we have going on. And so uh, we always need good energy. We always need good thought leaders. Uh, so join the movement. There are a lot of ways to join. Any other questions? Are you going to partner with the YWCA where they have places in the back where people can live and have classes? And so going back to what I was talking about with volunteers, so how the Second Family Success Center was chosen was we sent out requests to everyone to submit proposals. And then we had volunteers that read all the proposals they went on all the site visits, they did all the questions, and then they voted on which site to pick. So I would imagine that we'll have more and more. I don't know if it's on your radar. Just oh, it is. definitely, yes, uh-huh. And but they're a partner now. Yeah. Because they do amazing mm -hmm. things. Yeah, they're a partner now. Yes, ma'am. What do you hear in the community in terms of conversations about how public transportation can be transformed, can be in increased and yeah. improved? So I was talking to the city manager earlier this week about transportation and how the, our hubbing system works and how can we think about sub-hubs uh, versus just the hub downtown and how do we get, how do we think about a transportation system that is about the riders' employment opportunities and not convenience. 
we need transportation system, right? I rode tra public transportation all of my adult life until I moved here because it was about employment. And right now, our transportation system is not designed for employment. The jobs that families who ride the bus need to go to are not on the line to the degree that we need them on the line. But it is also really expensive to reroute a bus, so it really is transformation. We've got to rethink the whole thing, but we've got to make sure that other people don't start screaming because it's not because we want to redesign it with the mindset of employment. When you actually do it for workforce development only, it'll be a very different transportation system that everybody's not going to like. Because I didn't say students. I said employment, right? So students are going to be mad. I said employment. So that means the casual writer who's going from here to there to go to a party or go here and there, they're going to be angry. So we really do need to be thinking, and they are. Um, this, is a, this is a major barrier. When we talk to families, child care, transportation, or top two. So work is underway. Not in our control, but we are influencers. Gentlemen back there. I've always wondered why we have bus stop in Irving Park. Because that bus stop was designed originally to help domestic health get to Irving Park if we really want to cut through the chase. Because we're not going to dance around that. That's why. Because if you took our city and looked at at income levels and looked at where people associated to their income live and where they work, you will not see that straight line for a bus route as Michelle was talking about. Right, and now it's time that we can do something different. But we gotta, right, we gotta talk about these things. We can't be like, oh, oh, if we talk about it, right, we're not poking fires, we're just gonna talk back and move to solution, right? Don't, don't belabor it. That's why. Any other questions? Well, first, I just want to address the students here. And I'm sure the professors here at this great institute has said this, but just listen it from me. Regardless of who you volunteer with, volunteer. Because you never know who you might be standing next to when you're volunteering. If you look at the volunteers associated with the way, Dr. Leslie is a great example. We have CEOs, we have vice presidents, we have people from the very top all the way. You might never know who you're standing next to. You might never know what that person does unless you sit down, if you're giving out cookies or t-shirts or whatever, or working on a project. And you might also meet some very, very interesting people when you volunteer meeting Michelle, meeting Dr. Leslie, meeting people that you might never ever get to see because you don't understand their volunteers, what they bring to the table. So just when I say that you can do a lot of things with United Way, that's in volunteering, that's in mentoring, that's in doing all the things to help people that what we're trying to do. So please, don't ever think that it's all about money because it's not. We should always be leading with mission because if we can get people bought into our mission, they'll give money later and that's what we want. Folks, let's thank Michelle and Nadine. And then we and to, uh, to help students um, who are here with any bills that they may have, we do have, um, we do have a $50 attendance prize for any, for any student who attends. So would you please pull out a number, Michelle? Oh, let me, let me, let me. Okay, students. Oh, I love this number. One. Oh. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> 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 Good number. Oh, and refreshments. Don't forget to go.
Yeah. Michelle and Nadine yeah. will, will be here to talk with you one on one. There are assessments in the back. No. So please, um, please stay for a while. And students, I have a t-shirt for all of you. Yes. So come over here. You're these beautiful. And pick your size. You can pick a <laughs> You can pick after the students. Or you can come by the office and come first. Students come first, sorry. We do at the office? Here, I can grab that.